All right, the way that we run these maps in general is we start off by going around the room. We're going to try to do this very quickly. Short little who you are, and if you have a question that you would like to see answered today, let us know, put it on the board, and as we go through the discussion today, we'll try to revisit that, and that way we won't have to leave stand up as a little ways to talk about it, but we can respond appropriately to it. So, would anybody like to start and thereby set the wheels in motion? Um, All right. Erica Adam, Nutritional Sciences, um, and Nicholas. All right, Erica. Uh, I'm Nikhil Sugar, also from Nutritional Sciences, and uh, the same. This is my first one. So Nutritional Sciences representing. Very yes. good. My name is Cliff Cunningham. I work with the uh, uh, UW team, the John. Just here to find out how faculty are using tools. So that's a good question. Okay. Very good. Seth. Um, Seth Govich, part of the Chemistry Department. And I'm here to try and figure out how to get my students to actually answer my questions when I ask them instead of getting the exams. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Student game. Good. Nathan. I'm Nathan Dill. I'm a postdoc in engineering biology. And uh, yeah, I don't have any specific questions. All right. Just here to listen. You guys don't ask questions, it can be a very easy. Joanna, try to ask questions, questions later. <laughs> When I was growing up, I'm in horticulture, and I'm always looking for more ways to really get my students. Very good. Paul Schwartz, nursing. Perfect. It's good. Thank you. I'm Deanna Schneider with the Division of Extension, but I'm here because John Alfie has a problem to add uh, to represent a, a student experience because I'm in a 100% online master's program right now. So we wanted a learning experience. Yeah, thank you. Very good. Uh, I'm Jessica. I'm biological assistant engineering. So the biggest thing I've been struggling with is just to get the interest all very quickly. I want them to talk for a while, and I talk for 30 seconds, and then they go back to their online shopping. Sustained. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. Okay. I'm Carolyn Dosh Rickrell, and I'm an instructional center graduate in technology. And support for magazines and some courses. And the other courses. I'm going to learning. I'm going to see what to take back. All right. And, and this is good. So, one of the things that I want to do is think about how to structurally build these things in. So, it's not just one instructor does this, but how can even support staff say, hey, Here's a way to structurally add this element that will help to build it into the courses. AJ. Hi, I'm AJ. I also work at Do It in Academic Technology in our outreach program for um, high school students that are hoping to come to UW Medicine. <clears throat> so I have three tools in Canvas that I have questions about. And if we don't get to it, it's fine. I can research it. This is a fun place to talk about it. The tools are. Clunky in my experience, so like setting up sections seems to take forever. Um, I don't know what sections, peer feedback, especially for multiple assignments, and then get back to you. I'll, All right. I'll fill in that third one. I don't know where it's at. Okay. Uh, my name is Kenny. I'm a grad student in the kinesiology department, and uh, <coughs> I get uh, a lot of people All right, Kenny. I'm uh, Kevin Forker. I work for WIDA at the School of uh, Instructional Design. Good there. So, you can go to the school design. Yeah. All right, I'm going to hold off the mark because we'll use the back row. Sid? I'm Sid Freitag. I work at New Academic Technology with John, and I'm here to listen and see what people's questions are and what your interests are. I'm Margaret Murphy. I'm a grad student in the high school, but working here with, with uh, John and Jennifer. And I'm Jennifer, and I'm a grad student in physical therapy, and I help John with the active teaching labs. All right. 
I'm a professor in the psychology department. I think I'm going to give a talk here, a short presentation in a minute. What's really reassuring the number of the things that I'm not saying have anything, anything to do with what's going on I have multiple connections to this. Uh, I published several books on college teaching, um, stuff on inclusive uh, teaching practices that I'm going to talk about today. My main research area is uh, how to reduce prejudice and promote inclusion in a variety of settings, including the university settings. So I asked Marcus to come because he gave this great presentation at the uh, Teaching Academy in the Marmosonia event. And in it, he talked about the inclusive teaching, which I think will help sustain motivation and engage your students. And all of these things that we have, except for how to create sections in Canvas, um, we can start addressing through this. <clears throat> so, there are now um, a sufficient number of studies showing that students belonging to various minorities, and what I'm talking about is ethnic minorities, sexual minorities, religious minorities. These students come to our classes and seem to succeed less well. And that effect holds up even if you take into account um, prior preparation and achievement motivation. So, um, if you look, take into account people's GRE score, uh, sorry, SAT score, ACT score, if you look at their high school GPA, and in some studies they look even an entry test, starting test before they came into the class. So, if you equate for all that, or if you match, you, you pair matching where you match one student belongs to a marginalized group with a student belongs to a non-marginalized group, you still uh, find that students belonging to marginalized groups at lower grades drop out at a higher rate. Uh, one of the um, criteria that we do is to they drop the class in the first three weeks. Um, number of Ds and Fs, um, whatever criteria, they seem to be succeeding. And um, the evidence seems to be building that what's going on is that um, in the classroom setting, it is somehow communicated to them that they belong less to this place. They feel a decreased sense of belonging. They feel excluded. They feel that this is not their place. And that has effects on their achievement motivation and on their success. So it's not necessarily always blatant discrimination from classmates or racial slurs or whatever it might be. Actually, when our focus first comes out is that what they seem to be, um, seems to affect them the most is that the distance that happens at the classroom. The typical situation is that the instructor says, okay guys, uh, we're going to do a group project that's four groups to four students, but I didn't go ahead and four groups to four. Well, it just happens to be that the uh, Muslim student or the Hispanic student, uh, nobody asks them if they want to be in the group, and if they walk up to the group, and the other students, hey, we're already full, but then they walk away, and then they sort of turn around, and then there's another kid coming up, hey, you guys are in the group, suddenly for that person, there's still uh, um, uh, space in the group. Anyway, that's sort of one very prototypical uh, situation that they Tell us about. So it's more the less the explicit discrimination and racial slurs or what you might imagine. It's more the lack of inclusion, the, the, the distance, the social distance of silence that's, that's affected. So one of the questions is, as the structure was, what can we do about this? And I um, looked over the literature and, and what really, what has been proposed, but especially what has been tested and what has been shown to be effective. And that's what I'm going to briefly talk to you about. I focused on three because I sometimes feel there would be multiple speakers. But I mean, if, if you want more, there are more. <coughs> okay. So uh, the three that I have are is what's called the utility value. And um, communicating that intelligence is valuable and self information. While I'm talking, the best thing I'm going to do is immediately think about how could I integrate that in my own uh, teaching. Utility value was tested here extensively on campus by my colleagues, Judy Heritage, and I know some of you in chemistry, biology, have actually been part of these large scale randomized controlled studies where students are uh, randomly assigned to either the utility value condition or to a comparable control. 
So practice number one is utility comp. So the goal is that students see the real world utility of the materials that we were teaching. And that is helpful for every student, but that needs to be particularly helpful for students belonging to my class. And that particularly applies to all of these techniques that I'm going to talk about today. It usually means it's good for everybody, but it's especially good for those who are struggling, for those who have low confidence in, in their abilities in your class and uh, as students belonging to my class. But again, this is part of the universal, I mean, this fits under the idea of universal design. We did a curve cuts specifically for people who are in the military or whatever, but skateboard use them, buddy users can use them, et cetera. So it's all stuff wrong. Exactly. You show a video in class, you have the script, what's being said in the video, under the video. It helps especially people who have, who are hearing impaired or have a attention problem, but they actually should have to help everybody in the class. It's a good practice. Yeah. Okay. There are two approaches that have been extensively tested. One is uh, to have students generate uh, that utility value themselves, sort of writing a small writing exercise where they talk how they might apply that research uh, in their future job or in their personal life. Or slightly less effective, as it turns out, the instructor actually insists on the utility value and tells students what that might be used for. Uh, this is the first one, is of course more labor intensive than the second. Uh, the second is just be a sentence by the instructor or two. A writing exercise takes five minutes, uh, eight minutes to do. Okay, well, this is a little picture that has uh, to do with um, homework, say, about utility <laughs> of stuff. Well, some of the stuff that use utility is not immediately apparent. Here's one of the uh, empirical studies that examined that. Um, here's the person who's my colleague, Judy Herakovich. Uh, there are now um, six or eight uh, studies um, published to, uh, as an empirical paper. So what you have in the control condition, you have, this is, in this time it's confidence, high confidence students do lower than low confidence students. Here is instructor communicated utility value, you see the same difference. That is actually an exception. There are other studies where instructor communicated utility value did have a beneficial effect. But the big effect seems to be sort of joke generated if participants are encouraged to think for themselves about how the material that they're currently learning might be relevant to their own life, <coughs> might be useful, and might help them solve problems, either professional problems or personal problems. Do you suggest that that's done only after or sort of during the process of learning a specific thing? Um, um, the most classic uh, implementation of this approach is that students three times in the semester write a short essay at 150 to 250 words uh, where they ask, they pick one topic that they've learned in the previous two weeks and write about um, how that could be useful to their future. Professional and personal. Here we have uh, another study that actually shows that it uh, positively affects uh, minority students. So the majority students, those who do not belong to marginalized groups, do not suffer from this intervention. It certainly doesn't hurt them to think about the utility of what they're learning. Um, but there seems to be a big improvement for students belonging to marginalized groups. Number two. Malleability of intelligence, huge thing. Carol Dweck, Stanford University, has been promoting that for 20 years. She's finally doing the large scale studies. There are now studies done in high schools that involve 30,000, 40,000 students. And uh, it's pretty impressive what they succeed. I mean, one of the problem is that students very often and incorrectly believe that intelligence is something that's fixed and that it sort of doesn't really matter how much you practice, how much you learn. Either you're smart or you're dumb, and there's not really much that you can do about it. And the more we can do to get them to abandon that belief, the better it is for students there. The more students believe that intelligence is something malleable, it's something that can be worked on, it's something that can be improved, the better their <coughs> will be, and that we immediately anticipate, and once again, the students who seem to be benefiting from that the most are students belonging to it, marginalized groups. Um, they have recently used the 
metaphor that, uh, well, a brain is like a muscle. It's like any other muscle. Um, you go to the gym, you, you work on it to train that biceps or triceps. Well, the brain is just like that. A brain uh, can be um, trained, um, regular learning, regular exercise can be improved. It's not that you either you were good at math or you're bad at math. Uh, everything can be learned. Focus, the goal is to focus also on effort rather than on fixed um, qualities that seem to be stable. So here um, um, is one study. Um, it had to do with the intervention. We saw that we see that before. There is no differences between the experimental group and the target group and the control group. Um, then uh, the people in the in the experimental group receive that intervention. They are being into short um, um, like topic. Somebody's coming in talking ten minutes about the brain being or the intelligence being malleable, and then you see their grades. Um, or satisfactory course completion after the intervention, and how the difference goes up. So um, the intervention is effective for the average student. It helps everybody. But then uh, it seems to be particularly helpful for um, participants um, 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 belonging to min minority groups. What you have here is the control white group. You see the typical achievement gap. Control Latinos do better. They did not receive the intervention. They do poor, poor performance compared to their white counterparts. However, if you um, implement um, that intervention or you increase the belief that intelligence is malleable, that achievement gap uh, disappears um, uh, near the entire. I, I'm imagining that. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sorry. Uh, I've never seen done any studies looking at the the profession of the person asserting this. So if it's just the professor who is an expert in math saying this versus someone who's studied at ed education or psychology who has a background in uh, brain research, and if that makes a difference. Sure, that uh, sounds like a very reasonable question. No, I'm not aware. It seems to me, if I look, if I try to sort of in my head go through all the empirical studies that I've read, it has been implemented in wide variety of ways and it seems to be working anyway. I mean, definitely for different types of students, middle school, high school, and university students. And But sometimes it was an online module. Sometimes it was a handout, like a flyer. Sometimes it was the teacher who taught it. And sometimes it was a person who came in and gave a 10 minutes uh, presentation. So my first response would be, doesn't seem to be. But, uh, one, two, and then sorry. Yeah, I have two candidates of answer it, but I just want to specifically ask what does the intervention usually look like or what does the look like? Um, it's 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 um, I think it's a short online module where they show several data and and, and insist upon the fact that uh, that's just the current state of the scientific literature that intelligence is malleable and it would be um, incorrect to believe it's fixed. It, but it, it's relatively short. I mean, it's not very elaborate. And then in some studies, as far as I remember, the instructors were trained, and they spent five minutes talking about that. And the way I always think about that as an instructor, it's sort of an easy thing to do. There's a two-minute break. You switch from one topic to the next, or I don't know if the opportunity presents itself. And then you say, oh, well, by the way, I mean, we you now know that I mean, intelligence is something that's manageable. People can work on that, and it's something that um, can be improved. And, that's what we now know. And now that you know this, hey, let me move on to the next chapter of my presentation. That was my question. Okay. John, I'm sorry. Um, I, I'm wondering, does that need to be reinforced by actual students seeing their own results? So I, I imagine that if you say, oh, yeah, you're telling this valuable, and then you have one high stakes test, and you fail it, and you're like, oh, this is not reinforcing what that little intervention that I got that first week. Do they need to see lots of little steps of improvement? Do they need to track that? It is, of course, beneficial in the entire literature on that they call about recursive processes. So these kind of interventions work because they're mutual feedback loops that all feed upon each other. So the student starts to believe that his intelligence is malleable, then maybe starts to work more, and maybe has a positive experience on the next exam. Then that just reinforces the belief that intelligence is really something that's really malleable. It's working and studying harder. So that is sort of the ideal 
uh, scenario. Um, that may not always happen. Um, and the way I approach this, and I approach this in my teaching book, that should be combined with a whole, I think, set of other um, things that you might say as an instructor. One of the things is that, of course, and I mentioned that, you always want to put um, insistence on effort uh, and not on fixed uh, capacity, right? So you give back an exam and you say, okay, I want everybody with a score of 60 or lower to come to my office hours because obviously these people did not put in sufficient effort into preparing for this exam. Or maybe you use the wrong teaching uh, learning methods to prepare for this exam. So frame it as a matter of effort or maybe having done the wrong, not, maybe they did invest the amount of time, but um, if they used the wrong learning techniques to, to try to memorize the material. Uh, I would not frame it as a thing of fixed um, uh, capacity. Either you have it. I, I guess if you have a score of 60 in my class, that means you're not really uh, made for chemistry. Or that would be absolutely wrong. Same thing, and by the way, applies to the um, if somebody gets a hundred, you don't want to tell them, oh, you have to be made for chemistry. No, you want to tell you, you must have studied hard for this exam. You must have put a lot of effort into this class, and I'm super proud of you, right? So both and are just a effort. The other thing is how you deal with failure experiences. Um, failure is a signal to do something different, to study differently. So if you have not succeeded in this exam, that maybe shows Maybe you're putting in the time that maybe I want to teach you, come to my office, I want to teach you different study techniques. Maybe you waste time reading that textbook. Um, there are reading techniques of how you spend a certain amount of time and expect the maximum information. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Any other ideas on how to do this? I'm thinking learning strategies for peers. Would be a good way to. You know, it works. If you if you figured out something that works for you, you tell your classmates about it and you can compile those. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, for the um, undergrad and anatomy course, I support the instructor. It's a um, it takes a lot of effort towards active learning in the course. So there's a <laughs> bit in the course I'm pretty sure early on where things are described of like how the classroom can be set up, and then the instructor also talks about how she studied. Um, all this heavy duty anatomy stuff when she was a student, and here is the process that worked for me, and there's lots of emphasis on techniques and stuff. So it's kind of up from the start of the class, they're getting all these different approaches that they can um, try and think about, and there's lots of recognizing that this worked for me, it might not work for you, but here's something to try. And um, they encourage them to explore not just their default way of studying, but the kind of methods. Does anyone experience that? Say in Piazza or something? Are there discussions about the <coughs> university from somebody else how to do things? I think we like we recognize that we learn how to do things from other people all the time, right? Our peers and friends and like, oh, they don't do that. But we never do how much do we see that in classrooms, especially high ed classrooms, where I think traditionally it's been do your own work, keep your eyes on your own paper, it's all up to you. And I'm wondering if thinking is going to change on that, or if it's starting to change on that, with some of these social tools like Piazza, like discussion forums, maybe or maybe won't. I think we have to battle. I think it was a perspective from the, the last class I did, um, and um, we were being uh, we asked for from the professor examples of how to do it right. So, you know, we had projects and we had to come in and after, after the fact, people who had trouble said, can you show us how you solve this problem to the professor? And the professor said, no. Because I've shared that with you. There's lots of ways to solve this problem. I don't want you to get stuck on my way. And so then I asked, like, well, can, can students share how they solved it? And he said, yeah, to that. So then we all <coughs> shared with each other, and this is how I solved it, and we all did there, and so if people got a variety of approaches to solving the problem, none of them were going to go back. Back to number three, self-information. 
that is an interesting one because when I heard about it the first time, I actually didn't believe that. Mm -hmm. I didn't believe that it works. The idea here is that you give opportunities, students the opportunity to express their personal values and why they hold these values. Um, what is surprising is that that even works. The personal values seem unrelated to the course content or seem unrelated to um, academic motivation, which I find always uh, puzzling. Um, and the, the idea here, the underlying idea, let me see if I can that on the next slide. Okay, the underlying idea here is that um, that kind of, I value this, and here are why I value this, why here are why these values are important. What you're really thinking about is who you are as a person and who you stand for. And that is an important offer to what we call stereotype threat. Stereotype threat is the situation if you belong to a social group and, and if there's a general belief that that social group does poorly in, in that situation, I don't know, women and math or um, 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 ethnic minorities, don't feel or whatever. Um, if you're in the same situation, um, and you were aware of that stereotype, you were thinking, oh my God, I'm a woman and there's a math test, um, and, and I'm going to confirm the stereotype, does that apply to me and with the instructor? <coughs> that whole thing creates just a whole, a whole bunch of thoughts that actually prevent the student from doing well in um, exam situations. So um, that self affirmation, talking about um, what one's personal values are and why one holds these values, seems to buffer from that stereotype. Right? And um, again, the, the empirical evidence is now so overwhelming that this works, that it must work, even though I can find it something a little <coughs> surprising. So, so I would comment on that it's not surprising to me. Okay, go ahead. And the reason why it's not surprising is because I think it's, we're looking at a specific case of a general situation. That is, it might be stereotype threat, it might be another is anxiety. You can't learn when you're interested in it. You can't. And I think that that's something that I struggled with personally and then learned how to try to teach with that in mind. That bringing people's anxiety down yep. creates a place for this to learn. So, but what I, what I don't, but maybe. What I don't fully understand is why I'm talking about your values, why you hold these values, mentally brings your anxiety down. But it does. All I can say, it, it, it works. And I mean, the theory explains that, and I outlined it very well about why it should work. But these research was obvious for me. It, it was not obvious for me when I started reading about But yes. Uh, so this is what exam score in, uh, I assume it's a math test, sorry, increasing academic performance, it must be the less stem field I have taught here. Uh, in the, in the um, <coughs> condition, you have the gender gap uh, in that particular test, and that gender gap is reduced by about 80% uh, in a, uh, a situation where both men and women were given the opportunity to express what their values are and why they endorse them. Does this actually apply to the students who are 40 hours? No. It's just not. 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 In the studies that I know, where that actually sort of seems to be the case, is one of the things that you can do, that's another easy thing as an instructor, you can say, by the way, my tests are not gender biased. So what that shows is in previous exams, it has been shown that these kind of tests are similar tests. There is no gender gap um, when people take this test. And then, of course, in order to be ethical, you have to actually make sure that that is actually the case. But in some of the experiments where we can tell people's stories, that was not the case. It was the same test. And people over here were told, oh, by the way, there is a gender bias. And people over here were told, oh, there is no gender bias in this exam. And it was in this particular study that consistently the men did perform more for me in the session. <laughs> so if you tell the men that, uh, oh, by the way, that's a gender unbiased test, that seems to um, slightly decrease their performance. But most of the time, just to come back to the value of affirmation, I think you will see it in the next slide. It doesn't decrease the performance of students belonging to the non-marginalized.
And I wonder if this has something to do with the, that initial thing you said about the bonding. Like, by affirming who I am, it's, am I trying to play their game, or am I doing this for myself? Is it like, what's really important? Do I try to fit into whoever I am, into this other construct, which is artificial and often you know, more fictitious in our own perspective than what it might actually be? So is this just, a, again, before the test, sit down and before, as before you take question number one, who are you and what do you value? Is it before the semester? Is it a profile picture and bio page that you share very, with the class? Very good question. It's, again, a writing exercise that students do. Three times in the semester, they, or even in some study only once, is, hey, here are a bunch of values, 16 values. Please check the three that you endorse the most or that are the most relevant for you. And then please write a 250 word essay where you explain why these values are important to you and to your personal life. Are those writing um, those essays and things shared among all the classmates, or it just goes on the teacher? Not not part of, definitely not a necessary So part. it's not even that they're sharing the values necessarily with the class, just that they're expressing them. That you think things. about who you are, of what you value, what's important to you, and why that is the case. That seems to be what's driving me. Name drop. My wife is a psychologist, counseling psychologist, <laughs> and journaling is a big thing. I mean, people need to write down, spend time writing about, and, and when she's working with clients, it's often patients who have had huge traumatic drama in their life and just put things on paper. It's just phenomenal. The power of them. It's amazing. You guys are better psychologists than I am. I mean, you're all, <laughs> I have all these reasons why this works, and I love that. You had a point. Yeah, well, I would just be interested. Um, so we've talked about with these three points, sort of the classic way to do this with students is writing exercises. And I'd be interested in hearing or maybe brainstorming with everyone what are some other approaches where we could bring this into our classrooms that aren't necessarily just writing assignments. So... I also opening it up. But <laughs> finish that, let's, let's jump into that and let's start yeah. thinking about ways we can start to apply this. You have another. Oh, I, well, I was first just going to comment um, to your three points. Um, maybe it's you work with uh, professors that are, that really do the opposite of those three points. So it's definitely a culture of. You have to earn your place here. You don't belong. You're not good enough. And so it's then we're faculty associate advisors. So then I feel like our job is to come in and do these three things to kind of offset everything that we hear from our faculty. Damage control. Yeah. And so <laughs> I guess how do you change that culture within an entire department? You know. That we have probably better outcomes if we supported them from the beginning. Thoughts about that? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, earlier, I think when you were first listing the three, and it's just a little thought, but it seems to me I've sensed like defensiveness when you bring up these um, strategies. And I don't know where that defensiveness comes from necessarily, but it seems related to what you're saying too. On the part of the faculty member, too. Yeah. Or any teacher. I mean, I don't work with them. Too much. Too much. Kevin, if you want to ask. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm thinking of my colleague of mine who used to say that the school is designed for people who are good at it. And so, what happens? We forget this. I mean, I came from working most of my career working with community college students who, and he did this, where if you get students who they fought to get here, they're, they're kind of at the <coughs> top of that. Yeah. They kind of know what they're doing, even though that's a kind of a poor assumption because they don't always know what they're doing. Right. So, you know, in a way, we have to like, we have to create this. And you know, my job as a social designer is trying to convince individual faculties and departments to start to think along these lines. And it becomes when you start to see it click, it works because you see it in students' performance and smiles on their faces. Yeah. And, uh, I think you also get the nonverbal feedback as an instructor within a smile. Okay, it just goes better. Yeah. Reduce the burnout yeah. among instructors. 
Well, uh, it seems that sometimes we need it the most, or those who come the least often, so that it depends mm -hmm. on the teaching academy. <laughs> <laughs> and the other ones who need the fewest teaching books. Here's another empirical uh, studies. Um, all of them were low performing African American students. Um, this was prior to the intervention. No difference between the control condition and the treatment condition, and then over a two year period. Um, I don't know. It seems to be that there was a single intervention um, here uh, at this end point. And you see how these trajectories um, just continue over time. Um, that's what I talked before about recursive processes. Once you sort of have your first success experience at that first midterm, then you try to start to change your attributions so you <coughs> of yourself, how you feel in test situations, how much anxiety you have, yeah, something you can learn, something you actually understand, and et cetera. And then it seems to just, and, and, and even this would be the inappropriate measurement because that would simply be the post test of what they show. It actually, I mean, it sort of amplifies over time. Um, here are the three that I mentioned today, and many other, but I thought I'd focus on three and keep it short. Here's my name if you have additional questions. And I think the PowerPoint presentation will be shared with you, and what I have on the last two are um, the empirical references to the empirical studies if you want to read them yourself. If your colleagues don't believe you, and you want to study. So this is page one, and then I have a second That's uh, what it is. Uh, um, thank you, and uh, OK, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I, I wrote the PowerPoint on the activity sheet. So um, if you'll notice on the top of the activity sheet, there's a little paragraph that shows you how to get into our Canvas course. And the activity sheet itself is not interactive with the digital documents are. So the links don't work. Um, but in the Canvas course, once we get into that, we will add that. India. Yeah, so a question about some of the larger lectures, readout classes, let's say, mm, yeah. that have a grade on a curve. So a certain percentage of students are in a low going, and a certain percentage of students are going to excel, and a certain percentage of students are not. They can't all get in. And so that seems like to be like totally opposite, opposite right? of this. And so, but that, but there's, but, and there tends to be the kind of, this is the way it's always been done. This is the way it's always going to be done. Well, that's what I was put through this, Easy. Mm -hmm. put through this, <laughs> and a story. Um, and kind of, and sort of the question of how are we going to change the culture um, of departments or specific faculty? I think it's even more of just of higher learning when it. I think there are you know certain. It's sort of like it seems to be tiered, and it's like the the folks who consider themselves the the engineering or. You know, as you go up and up and up, that becomes re reinforced more and more and more, rather than less and less and less. And yeah. So, so it's the entire institution culture. Right? Many thoughts about that, but maybe other people too, because they really want to ask that. Yeah. And as an academic, I'm an academic advisor, not an instructor or faculty. Um, and it, it kind of heals me to see kids who have all the potential in the world because intelligence is malleable, be shut out of something that they would be brilliant at. Yeah. Well, I mean, for the anecdote, um, in psychology, our big intro class, it turned out that we have one of the highest achievement gaps. And he said, I'm going to do it back to you, that this is shameful. Here we study these. Topics. And then what do we have in our psych intro class with one of the biggest achievement gaps? Because one of the things that actually turned out that right in the curve disproportionately affects marginalized students, and we all talk about that. One of the first things we did, we got rid of right in the curve. And um, there's now expected <coughs> knowledge that the students even need to have and need to succeed. Um, there's still a lot of reading out, maybe slightly less so than before, but it's not grading on the curve. 
and we are beginning how do I see the gap? Just getting rid of the gap. Do we find they tend to be first student, right? First semester. And so oftentimes it's just teaching them how to study. So it's not, you know, they don't understand. They don't go to lecture. They won't get you know, that way. So uh, that's usually what we have to work through. Is you might be, yeah, come from just high school, you know, that studied, and now you actually have to study. So we can get them through the first two years. Usually see that. Like, And part of the kind of study is like, as instructors, I think a lot of us came up through this. I fought and I was hazed and I survived, and this is what it takes. So, oftentimes, I think we're not the ones to say it's hard for us to make that change because it's normal for us. And it's so this, it, it becomes a larger <coughs> hurdle. Then, and I think this is making where. When we start to do these things, we're going to broaden the scope. We're going to keep on learning ourselves how to make it more accessible for a broad range of people to be successful without the hazing. And they can learn how to study for themselves and, and, and be successful. Is that in terms of competency type, you develop competency or not yet? Not A, B, C, D. Uh, it's like, oh, you're not there yet. Keep trying. But, you know, I mean, this is academia, it was built on that model. And this is more competency based type of programs that are kind of challenged to implement. But there are elements of that that we can, that we can have in our classes. Like, they kind of more of those things to science. And, and they're you know, more about uh, this is helping develop, develop the skills, particularly for these, these first, first couple semester classes. That way, so if you're not there, you, that way the goal is by the time you finish cycle 401, everyone's going to master these materials at this level. I think another teaching guy who followed a great video, I can't remember his name, but he was in journalism. And for the first assignments, they graded them at this level. I think so often we're like, oh, it's early in the semester, let's make it easy. And then they do well, and they're like, all right, I can, I can succeed at this. And then the next class for the time they're graded harder, and they're like, ah, oh, I didn't get a better grade. But what they do is they say, you're graded at this level here, oh, poorly. You're graded at this level here, oh, I did better than last time, but I'm still not there. And eventually, by the third week, they say, if you do this, you will be up at this level. And the students can see that. And I'm like, I can just have a journalistic level, not at a student level, not as a beginner level. There's a big gap that we're using. The is based on the professional. It's going to take you four years to get to there, but just because you're doesn't mean you're failing. That could also be discouraging, right? It could also be discouraging. I've already implemented that with a lot of caution and a lot of showing statistics in the previous classes of how they did on the first exam. Yeah. And I think that, that, that gets to the, and, and what they do is they have the students come in and say, or, or share that information. And like, it was hard, but trust me, I got through it, you can get through it too. Chemistry does this as their week zero um, things, where they have the students from previous courses saying, this is what I did to survive this class. Go to the lectures, do the whatever, do the whatever. I was discouraged the first week, you we were too. By the fifth week, I was able to do it, so can you. And I think that that kind of encouragement, it's especially strong because it's not coming from the instructor, who's a professional, right, who's the expert, but it's coming from people that they see as peers who were just recently in their spot. Um, I think you worry about these different interventions and the students that are appropriate and useful because malleability and self-deprecation could almost happen any time inside or outside the course, right? And even utility is a little bit more of a stretch because in the course it's good to know why you're there and what the purpose is. But if you know why you're in college, you know, so it could be that instead of trying to change the culture from professor to professor or faculty, you know, just overall, again, we have a first year experience um, office and 
um, advertising and stuff. Because those things are happening in a broader scale with that. Does that work? I guess that's what I'm thinking, but from your perspective, I'd rather the data on whether it's more effective to do it in the first year experience or whether it's when it's when it's instructed or implemented. I, I don't know that all I know is that there's I think the college transition network, which is again a, a, a network of I don't know, forty universities but they're not trying to implement that. And I think there's part of the first year um, experiences. Um, the empirical studies just because you want to have a little more control study are usually done within the classroom to so the instructor. But yeah, yeah it's just certainly done yeah. in the first year. This is why I've done the advertisers here and why instructional technologists I, I would love to see these things sort of baked into the structure of the course, into the templates. Like think about it, if you write a uh well to the class and you know that kind of thing, how many of the instructors are going to change that template? Some will. But a lot of them are going to be like, oh, it's already written. And if you can make it in there as an instructional technologist, they don't have to come to this session because it's not already stuck in that. So what are, what are some other ways that these things can happen in your courses? Okay, well, one question I would make. What do we do or say to someone who brings it across? Um, for the intelligence and valuable thing, we're talking about how to implement it and just tell them. Um, I, I was thinking back to some of the classes that I took as an undergrad, and uh, I, I know like. When I would have a test or something that I knew I had a chance to retake if I wasn't happy with my grade, like I think that was the way that I was able to see, like, oh, first time I didn't do so great, but I know I can take it again, I'll study harder, take it again, and then I have to see that improvement period as an example, or like written work where you do multiple revisions that are graded or reviewed by your peers, and you get feedback, write it again. So that type of thing where you get feedback and do it again. And just keep improving oh, yeah, and see your growth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One of the courses that I took
Yeah, I always loved learning about what people from my department or, or something had done after they graduated, like you know, figuring out what what they're doing with that degree and just like connecting with those people was always exciting. So and maybe you had that particular skill that you're just teaching or just taught now help them succeed in what they were doing now. So Mike McGuire in the School of Community Ecology does this all the time. He gets alumni from past courses to come in and say, hey, was my course useful? What parts were useful? What parts were? He takes that feedback himself, but his students hear it as well. And so it's a very honest conversation that I'm in the field right now. These are the things that I learned in McGuire's class. And you know, pay attention because they're good. And that kind of thing. And it's easy to do, right, with, with, uh, with uh, Blackboard Collaborate. You can just, you know, during that lunch break sometime, have them up on screen, get that three minute video with the past students. It doesn't have to be perfect. Cool. Any other ideas? We've got two minutes left. Anything that we talked about that, sorry, we didn't hit sections today. Uh, peer feedback, we will be having a um, session on, a lab on peer feedback. We've got several instructors at UW Madison who do that, both <coughs> in Kansas and outside of Kansas. I think the idea of feedback is, is another really good one that we've heard a lot today. And it, it's, a, it's a way to get a different perspective, not just from the expert instructor, but as Gav said, you know, here's how I solve the problem. Here's Try it this way, look at it from this perspective that we sometimes don't get. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, for student engagement, I think it was Sam's question about the uh, credits when you ask a question in class. Yeah. Um, I struggled with that a lot last year. This year, I started having the students talk to each other for like two minutes when I ask a question <clears throat> and let them know that either they need to select a representative who's going to answer it or that I will call on people mm -hmm. after that. And, both the question and answers got much better, and the feedback on at the end of the semester also got much better from that. So I would say just let them chat and you know, gauge how long you think it should take them to think about the question. Just double that. Um, have them chat with each other, and then answer it. But the report back features, I think, are really yeah. integral part of it because if you just have them talk about it with no performance afterwards. So I usually I'll talk for two, two minutes, then I'll say it's 30 seconds left, he's like, he's going to be the person to answer. Yeah. And we sit at tables, so I have 15 tables, and I just get a table and put a call on them. But I've had no complaints this year. But yeah. I have actually zero empirical data to back this up. All right, let's do it. But when I teach classes, if I expect it to be a discussion call, <coughs> um, I ensure that I get them talking about something within the first five minutes of class. Mm -hmm. I launch into a 20 or 25 minute lecture and I stop, I ask a discussion question, and they've already spent the last 40 minutes just in this passive receptive mode, and it's just like it is much more difficult to get them up and out. So either come in and get settled, get the backpacks out, and get the laptop set up, get them talking then, and then after a good exchange, we can get also. And if they can talk about how this is useful in that, and two parts is one stone, stone, right? <laughs> or examples of when I Thank you very much for coming. Uh, please help thank Marcus for coming. And all kinds of stuff that I never had the data for, so I'm glad we found the data for it. Uh, please, on your way out, if you could fill out the evaluation sheet, tell us what you liked and what you didn't like. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Deanna, for coming as well. And give me this practice and look back.